stragglers coming in here one last little second before we go to see, then we'll get started.
So things are changing out there. I don't know if you saw today's announcement of the acquisition that uh, helped, helped make. Right, so we got every day somebody else is thinking shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, which required us to continue to figure out ways to show value. We'll talk about that a little bit more. I also want to talk about this notion of branding as personal ideology. And I would tell you that really this whole notion of personal ideology and branding is really at the crux of what 12 Cares is all about. And why people like yourselves are sitting in the room and wondering what it is that we're talking about. And then we'll talk about the genesis of the organization, what's happened in the first 12 months, and what's going to happen in the next 12. And then if I've sufficiently inspired you enough to be uh, interested in doing something, there's opportunities for you get involved both with the organization as well as just what you're doing in your day-to-day -day work. Actually, I have some folks here in this room right now who are actually already incorporating some of this stuff. This is the work we're going to talk about, some of the ways that that's being done, and the way the form and the shape that that's taken so far. And then, lastly, we'll talk about, like, I'll, I'm going to be around for questions, and uh, there's a few others from the organization that are in the room as well at the end, so there's opportunity that you'd like to take to spend some time talking to us or I'd be able to do that. If you counted the number of hugs and hellos in the promotional products industry, I agree with the that all industries in love hellos. Fair. We are probably the most people-centric industry that I've ever, ever been a part of. I've had the good fortune to have sold some other things besides promotional marketing, and I can assure you competitors in the copyright industry don't love each other. <laughs> They just don't. And a lot of that has to do with what I perceive as um, our, 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 our industry attracts people, 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 persons. Because if you think about the nature of imprints and artwork and imprint areas and all the things that are going, going into making a decorated piece of uh, promotional products come to you on time and correctly, there's all this interaction that typically has had to go on throughout history, right? Like, I gotta talk to you about your PMS color. That color isn't right. If you don't have this substrate, is it gonna look correct? So there's always constantly been this frequency of interaction between buyer and seller in the promotional products industry. So consequently, we attract people who are into talking people. But guess what? The people that are on the other side of the transaction now are really not that interested in talking to us. But in the meantime, we're still trying to figure out what's going on here because. Just like today, every time you turn around, somebody wants somebody, and the space is getting smaller. And for those of us who are not top 40 distributors, which I'm thinking is a lot of you in the room, when you start seeing this consolidation, it's scary. So it starts making you feel like, okay, like if these businesses are going to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger, it means they're going to have more and more resources to do things like make the database right and make the web solution correct and all the things that our buyers are typically uh, expecting from us due to what's on Amazon. So what you're seeing is with all this money coming into our space, there's just this race going on for us to try to look more like that so that as these buyers get younger, we're gonna look attractive to them in the way that they're gonna wanna do business with us. So as a smaller distributor, it gives me a lot of concern for you on this whole notion of how are you gonna be able to continue to Look at our LinkedIn profile. My headline says the robots are coming. Okay? And to me, when we're faced with this um, challenge of not being able to compete with the big boys or compete with technology, then we have to compete with heart. And so this is really at the base of what we're talking about. But fortunately, we are in the great situation of the fact that as our buyers are getting younger, they absolutely positively are looking for reasons to do business with companies that are not to do necessarily with price, not necessarily to do with the kind of technology that you're using in order to conduct that transaction. What they're really looking for is what does your brand stand for? What does your company mean to the marketplace in the world? Because if I'm going to spend this money, I want to have at least a fighting chance to know that the money I'm going to spend is going to go and make the world a better place. And if I have that option, especially in a vacuum, so if I have two equally interesting things that I might buy that both cost the same amount of money, that the MOQ is the same, the lead time is the same, the imprint area, everything is the same. The only difference is one of them has a give back component and the other one doesn't. Millennials will make the bottom choice for the product that has the give back component. 
almost invariably. Additionally, if you look at what you can't see on this, is basically saying what matters most to millennials in making their buying decision for the choosing a vendor, the big line there says the company's community involvement and the company's value. So if you're not communicating how you're acting in the community and what your values are, you're missing out on creating a relationship with that buyer because that's exactly what they're looking for. It's the first thing they're looking for. Uh, three 20, three mid 20 year old children, and the first thing that they do when they pick up last year's catalog that they see in our products, uh, my soon to be daughter walked in and she said, Why is it all white? She didn't, even, she didn't even look at the product, she didn't look at the prices, she looked at the people in the catalog and said, This isn't a diverse company, they have all white people in the catalog, how come there's not any uh, ethnicity or gender variation in this catalog? Never even thought about that. That's just not where we come from in making these buying decisions. But that's the first thing she noticed when she picked up this catalog and told me about it. So what you can't see there is Anne Hanley is um, she's a she's a big shot in marketing these days, and she basically says that um, whatever you're doing in B2B from a marketing perspective that it's not working, stop. Because it's not working. And consider how might you change what you're doing in a way that would be a reflection of what people's buying habits are, and actually um, might actually provide you a return on investment for that expenditure. So, the industry is shrinking. Our buyers are getting younger. I'm painting a pretty gloomy and gloomy picture up here, <laughs> but in a lot of ways, it's the, it's the reality of the situation that we're all facing. Now, when we talk about how we are going to stay Relevant, how are we going to stay competitive? How are we going to maintain our position and keep our paychecks and keep our kids in those big schools that we're all going to? It is by matching our differentiation with that customer's need, right? So I have the good fortune to produce four podcasts a month, two of them for from Pierce Radio, two of them for my own sales effort. So I'm producing four podcasts a month, which is a lot of work. But the good news is I get to speak to people from outside the industry who are frequently discussing topics around differentiation. And two of the biggest interviews that I had over the course of this past year was the guy on the left is Anthony Amarino, which are his three books up at the top. The only sales guy here on the knee, keep their lunch in the lost art of closing. And then the gentleman on the right is Stan Phelps, and that's his big book there by Goldfish. Stan has written a number of books all written around this whole about goldfish topic, which is the notion of being able to do little things to change the value that you provide to your customer. You don't have to throw everything out the window and start over. You just make small changes, and that's the idea. You don't have to be a whale. You can be a goldfish and change. And in each of these interviews, it was stunning to me to hear both of these guys saying, if you're not figuring out a way to provide that differentiation via added value, you're going to lose. So I'm hoping that I'll see some bumps on my SoundCloud statistics for you guys and listening to these speakers in the next week or so. But really what we're, what we're talking about is in, in this sea of sameness that everyone is fighting through in order to try to win the day from the sales perspective, you have to have something to stand out. You have to have something that's going to be a reason for that person to want to make that buying decision because in the absence of all of that value, the only way you're going to get that order is on price. I know that we're all struggling with trying to maintain our margin for the past days. So, having said that, when you look through these uh, episodes and through this concept, really at, at the underlying concept of all of it is this notion of being able to bring purpose. Bring purpose to what you're doing. Don't leave your giving card at the door. So, before we start looking at what's going on in the industry, what you and I and the world know is that typically, our industry's consumption habits often model retail. So I'm excited to see that it doesn't take it long for retail to get into our space in the years past. And this is a very similar example. We're seeing all over retail this notion of purpose being injected into people's brains. Here are some of the examples, obvious ones being things like Tom's shoes. I mean, that's sort of the godfather of a lot of this was, you know. Thomas and their movement, but you're seeing it across the board. Sephora, Sephora Stance has a beautiful program on cost marketing. 
And then uh, even traditional manufacturers like Ford, Ford has a Ford foundation and they've been very, very instrumental in rebuilding Puerto Rico. And they basically said that I'm being in Detroit and Rockwell is going to see the paper all the time. But basically, Ford has said they will not be Puerto Rico at the bottom of the Rico. They're using the foundation's funds to be able to help do that. And then, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the speed. Speed is a value line. Really want to see it coming to our space. Can 